So in three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the Equity Committee meeting with the Equity Advisory Council for Thursday, January 11, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person meeting, committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee and council members will state their names before speaking. Ms. Siebel, please call the role of the board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good afternoon, um, Ms. Drummond. Ms. Frempong. Here. Oh, sorry about that. Ms. Drummond, okay. Ms. Frempong. Ms. Lichter. Here. Ms. Tulowski. Here. Ms. Harvey. Present. And Dr. Savoy. Here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Seabolt, please call the role of staff members on the Equity Committee participating in today's meeting. Mr. Handy. Present. Uh, Ms. Charlie Green. Present. Thank you. I don't believe we have anybody else, but are there any other staff members? And I think we're Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Seabolt, please call the role of the Equity Advisory Council members participating in today's meeting. Elisa Alonzo. John Bailey. Present. Sharon Blake. Jackie Brewster. Present. Clifford Collins. Crystal Collins. Kamari Corbin Yates. Bianca Crockett. Heather Denmeyer. Marietta English. Present. Thank you. Michelle Feeney. Here. Thank you. Sandy Gold Rains. Michael Grubbs. Octavia Guthrie. Javine Hardin. Kevin Jennings, Marquetta McLean, Catherine Mullen, Kristen Nielsen. Present. Thank you. Lisa Norton, Marlena Purcell. Corinne Peoples, Abir Ramad Anshanawi, Makita Scott. Present. Thank you. Brian Schiffer, Donna Sibley. Present. Thank you. LaShawn Stitt. Steph Sunderman Zingler. Lauren Tillman. Orion Trustee. Present. Thank you. And Juliana Valencia Banks. Present. Is there anyone uh, participating on the call that I did not mention? Good evening. This is board member from Pong. Oh, there you go. All right, I think we're good. Uh, Miss Ebo. Yes. 
I'm sorry, Dr. Savoy. Uh, so when you called Mike Grubbs, uh, he did uh, text me. He said he is driving, so he's listening via phone. So I guess he's on the listener side or the okay. attendee side. So I just wanted to uh, let you know. Thank you. I'll note that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is a presentation on working with immigrant communities and the importance of language access. And for that, I call on Ms. Juliana Valencia Banks with the Baltimore County Government Office of Immigrant Affairs and co-chair of the Equity Advisory Council. Ms. Banks. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Juliana Valencia Banks. I am the Chief of Immigrant Affairs for Baltimore County Executive John Olszewski. Very excited uh, to be presenting to this uh, esteemed group. The Baltimore County Office of Community Engagement partnered with Gateways for Growth, a nonprofit, non nonpartisan organization, to secure a catered research report regarding Baltimore County's New American community. When we use the term New American, we are referring to immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, documented folks, um, anyone that is foreign born, regardless of their immigration status or length of residency in Baltimore County. This uh, report gave us very important information about who our new neighbors are, um, where they work, how they contribute to the county. Um, and based on this report, we are developing a countywide immigrant integration and inclusion plan. So we will be um, discussing that tonight, as well as language access, which is um, something that we've talked about previously. Next slide. So when we talk about refugees or asylees, oftentimes these terms are used interchangeably. However, they are two different terms. Um, and for legal purposes, it's important to understand that there are, is a difference. Um, and when we are talking today, we are talking about immigration law, not not international law um, or immigration law in other count in other countries. So um, a refugee is a person who has been forced to leave um, their native country in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. Um, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees makes this designation. Refugees then are resettled um, into a different country. And for instance, in the United States, when refugees are resettled into the US, they come in with permission. They're also connected to a refugee resettlement organization that provides support, um, case management, connects them to resources, workforce development, education, um, to enable them to be better integrated into the US. They're also able to apply for a work permit uh, which will give them the ability to work in the U.S. with permission. Refugees are able to adjust their status and apply for a green card a year after arriving into the U.S. Once that green card has been awarded, um, they are able to apply for naturalization or to become U.S. citizens um, five years after getting their green card. Asylees or asylum seekers are people who are seeking or have been granted asylum. International law guarantees that people fleeing persecution the ability to ask for asylum. So these folks are more often than not the folks that we think about um, currently at the southern border. Um, a person that is seeking asylum is an, uh, is an asylum seeker. Once that asylum has been granted, which is a very long legal process, um, that person becomes an asylee. Uh, once that person has their asylum granted, they are eligible to apply for work permits. Um, they're able to apply for their green card a year after their asylum has been granted and five years after they receive their green card, they are able to apply for naturalization. Unlike refugees, asylees don't work with any um, resettlement agency formally. There are no benefits or services that they receive. Many of them will connect to nonprofit or community-based organizations that are able to assist them 
but refugees get very specific services and are entitled to benefits and services that asylum seekers are not entitled to. Next slide. When we talk about folks that don't have permission to um, live in the United States, we use the, uh, the term undocumented. Any other term is uh, dehumanizing and othering. So we encourage everyone um, to please use the term undocumented when they're talking about folks that lack uh, the documents required for um, legal immigration or residency here in the US. Next slide. Mixed status families is a term that um, is important to understand. A mixed status family is a family whose um, members may include people with different citizenship or immigration statuses. For instance, there could be a parent that is undocumented, children that are US born citizens, and children that are either DACA holders or um, in the process of applying for asylum. So many of our families while the children may be U.S. born, their parents may be mixed status, um, and the number of mixed status families here in the county is growing. Next slide. These um, graphics are all from our Gateways for Growth New Americans report, and these um, numbers come from the 2018 American Community Survey. Uh, most Folks that work in similar roles to myself or um, data analysts don't use the American Community Survey results from 2020 because there was so much um, mistrust in participating in the census, whether it was because of COVID or because of fear of um, being harmed, particularly families that are mixed status or undocumented were very fearful of um, filling out the census. So. Based on this data, we estimate that more than 12% of our county is foreign born. So I would say we are probably closer to 14% given all of the different shifts in, pop in um, communities. Uh, without new Americans moving to Baltimore County, we would have seen a shrinking population. Um, so we are thankful that folks are choosing to live in Baltimore County and call Baltimore County home. Next slide. So thinking about this and how it impacts BCPS in our communities at large, more than 50% of our county residents have at least one foreign born person in their household. Um, this impacts the number of children that we have in our schools. It also impacts, you know, the number of seniors. Um, it impacts how we use recreation and parks, uh, the way that we are developing and starting businesses. Um, the majority of our immigrants in the county have resided here for more than five years. So we have a large long-standing new american community more than 84 percent of it but we are seeing an increase in influx of recent arrivals so folks that have lived in the county for less than five years obviously with what is uh happening in ukraine what happened in afghanistan and what's happening now um, in the middle east we are seeing uh, more folks arrive next slide Baltimore County, uh, for those of you that do not know, is home to one refugee resettlement organization. Lutheran Social Services is located on the west side of the county. They have their office there. Um, they are one of five resettlement organizations that operate in the United States. In Maryland, we have uh, resettled refugees through Lutheran Social Services, the International Rescue Committee, um, and World Church Services. Our refugee community, community here in the county is upwards of 6,000 folks. So these are folks that have come in with permission, have resettled in the county. Um, of note, our refugee community has contributed $35.8 million into federal taxes, $23.8 million into state and local taxes. So in addition to the many beautiful contributions of our refugees, 
neighbors, they are also impacting our county um, financially. Our top countries of origin for um, our refugee population is Burma, Ethiopia, uh, Ukraine, and Vietnam. This is a, num uh, a list of countries that will probably change in the next, um, or has already changed, in, um, but will be changing again um, in the next few years. 64% of the refugees in the area have been able to naturalize, um, so they've been able to go through the process of adjusting their status to green card holders and then becoming U.S. citizens. Um, our refugee community is well educated. 36.9% uh, of our refugees hold at least a bachelor's degree, while 15, uh, more than 15% hold an advanced degree. Next slide. This is a very interesting graphic. It uh, talks about our undocumented community. We have more than 23,000 um, undocumented folks living here in Baltimore County. They are also, very important to note, uh, high contributors to taxes, $30.8 million um, in federal taxes, $22.7 million in just state and local taxes. Some of you may be wondering um, how undocumented folks are able to file taxes if they don't have a social security number. Um, what these folks will do is they will file for an individualized taxpayer ID number, and this number allows them to declare their taxes. Um, oftentimes, our schools will get requests from uh, parents or guardians uh, requesting enrollment verification for their students. This helps them in the process of applying for ITINs or the individualized taxpayer ID number. Our top countries of origin for our undocumented community is from El Salvador, Nigeria, India, Mexico, and Guatemala. These countries will probably shift the next time uh, we pull this report. We may see um, India or Guatemala dropping out, and we may see Venezuela or Colombia um, breaking the top um, the top five. Next slide. Um, our DACA eligible population is upwards of 2,000. Um, DACA eligible folks are folks that uh, came into the U.S. before their 16th birthday and were able to apply for a program that was. Um, put forth by the Obama administration. This program allowed um, certain young people to apply for DACA. They had to have either completed high school or gotten their GED, not be a major um, threat to public safety, so have no serious criminal background, um, and be under the age of 21 when the, or when the program was established, there are no more um, new DACA holders. So our oldest DACA recipient, so these may be the parents of some of your U.S. born um, students, are in their early 40s. So the oldest DACA recipient is 42, and our youngest DACA holders are 18. So we no longer have um, the ability to apply for DACA for the first time, but we do have folks that are renewing DACA. DACA, unlike uh, asylum or refugee status, did not provide a direct pathway to um, getting a green card or naturalizing. Um, these folks are protected from deportation or removal unless um, they get themselves into serious criminal trouble. Um, but they are able to uh, apply for a work permit, renew it, and work with permission in the United States. Um, DACA has to be re renewed every two years, and the families pay $495 to renew this work permit. Our DACA eligible community contributes to our federal um, income taxes and $10.3 million. Um, local taxes, $6.8 million, with a spending power of over $51.6 million. And these numbers are specific to Baltimore County. So it's not a statewide number. It is not a national number. This is numbers specific to 
um, Baltimore County. Next slide. So now that we've gotten some basic information out of the way, we wanted to talk about some of our challenges that our new neighbors face. So when we're thinking about communities um, living in poverty or marginalized communities, we often think about different challenges that they may face access to employment, housing, education, transportation, um, criminal justice, healthcare, um, some of those safety nets uh, that we so often take for granted. Um, adding to these challenges, we've got two very important things. We've got um, folks' immigration status and their ability to communicate effectively in English. So immigration status and language um, are additional challenges that these folks may face. Next slide. Our new Americans, um, while only 12% of our county population, they do represent um, more than 15% of our working age population. So our new Americans um, tend um, to skew younger. 19% um, of them are STEM workers. 15% uh, of them are in working age. Our new American community contributes and works actively. However, some of the challenges and barriers that they can face, um, and this is something that you have to consider when thinking about the families, the parents of the student, our BCPS students, is that uh, some of the families may be unaware that they have um, rights as workers. So for instance, um, our minimum wage just went up. A lot of folks are not aware that minimum wage went up. They may also not be aware that um, there's overtime pay or that if they get injured on their job that the, um, the employer is responsible for that. Um, oftentimes we hear of folks that are uh, brought in to do some day labor work and the uh, person that is picking them up um, is aware that this, uh, this person does not have permission to work in the U.S. or doesn't have a social security card or number and they will have them work for a week or two and then on payday will turn around and ask for a social security number. Um, and then because the individual is not able to produce one, will not pay them. So these are forms of abuse that some of the parents um, in BCPS are facing. Um, next slide. Housing, 53% um, of the new Americans in Baltimore County own their own homes. Um, this is compared to 67.4% of U.S. born households. This means a total property value of $7.3 billion. And it also means that uh, the portion that is not owning their own home are renting and it's generating $262.7 million in rental payments. Uh, the reason we bring up housing as an, uh, an issue that's important to discuss when thinking about our new American students, their families, or our mixed status fa uh, families is because many folks don't know that as tenants, as renters, that they have rights, um, that a landlord can't evict them without you know, a certain amount of notice that when there are uh, when the house is falling apart when a rental unit is falling apart that they're able to get that fixed um, folks uh, can often have challenges in finding rental units that will rent to them so many of them are renting in the informal fashion um, they won't sign a lease because they'll um, you know house share and so sometimes it can become challenging for um, our new American parents to produce leases for enrollment verification. It can also be challenging because um, particularly for our refugees um, that come in, they don't have a rental history in the country, right? They don't have a credit history. So these things can become challenging um, when folks are trying to rent uh, an apartment or a house in the formal way because of the lack of rental or history, credit history, employment history here in the U.S. that can be challenging and also opens up folks to abuse at the hands of um, inscrupulous landlords that take advantage of their fears or their um, lack of awareness of protection as tenants. 
Next slide. Education, this is a very important slide, obviously, for you all. Um, our county's population, age 25 or above, that had a high school education or more, um, is 54.9% of immigrants um, in comparison to 37.3% uh, of U.S. born folks. An interesting fact about um, new Americans generally is that while at the same time nationally, they are more likely to hold an advanced degree than U.S. born folks, they are also more likely to have less than a high school education. Um, in many jurisdictions across the country, their unique educational profile allows um, these folks to fill in key labor shortages um, at both the high skilled spectrum, tech fields, um, and more manual sectors like construction or food services. Um, things to keep in mind about um, young people with undocumented uh, parents, those U.S. born children are eligible for um, finan federal financial aid. Um, children that are undocumented, unfortunately, are not eligible for federal financial aid. There are certain undocumented immigrants uh, that are in the process of adjusting their status through various forms of immigration relief that are eligible for federal financial aid. So as educators, it's very important um, that our college counselors are aware of the nuances of working with mixed status families um, and re recent arrival and um, other new American communities. Next slide. Folks with limited English proficiency, so folks um, for whom English is not their first um, language and who have uh, less than good ability to communicate in English. Um, it's over 16,000 um, immigrants living in the county have um, limited English proficiency. Um, this means that it's important to be aware of um, rules and regulations that protect these folks. Um, the top five um, languages uh, spoken at home other than English in Baltimore County are Spanish, Korean, Chinese, Russian, and Arabic. Um, interesting facts uh, with these folks, uh, less than a high school diploma is held by more than 42% of them. A high school diploma is held by 41% of them. Um, advanced degrees or bachelor's degrees are at 15%. Next slide. So now we'll talk about language access and um, its importance and the role it plays within the school system. Um, first of all, just establishing a couple of things. Language access is the law. It's required by federal mandates and um, that protect the rights of folks with limited English proficiency. As public servants, as educators, it's our job um, to ensure that all of um, our folks who are choosing to live in Baltimore County have access to information regardless of their language ability. And it's also the reality of um, our changing school system. It's the reality of our, our county. Um, the demographics are changing. Next slide. So when we're talking about folks uh, with limited English proficiency, we're talking about folks um, that do not speak English as their primary language and who have limited ability to read um, speak or write or understand English. Um, these folks may speak two or three other languages, but English may not be the one that they're the most proficient, proficient in. Meaningful access refers to accurate, timely, and effective communication with um, LEP folks, and it's um, provided through language assistance at no cost to the LEP individual. Translation. Um, Translation and inter interpretation are often used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Translation refers to assistance related to written documents, and interpretation is verbal language assistance, and it can happen in person or telephonically. And vital documents are those that are critical for obtaining service or benefit or are required by law. Um, and it also means that we should be notifying uh, folks of a particular service. Next slide. This covers our legal obligation for why we must implement language access across um, all of our schools. Um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination based on 
national origin, which also includes language. It provides that funds shall um, be withheld from any institution or program that is recipient of federal financial assistance, which continues to discriminate in violation of this law. So this means that the school system could face um, some challenges if it refuses to implement language access or discriminates against folks. Um, our exec executive order 13166, um, issued by then President Bill Clinton, mandates that language assistance in federal and federally funded programs be available at no cost to individuals. Um, we have seen Title VI complaints um, in the state of Maryland. Um, most recently, it happened in Baltimore City. Um, so we do not want to be one of those um, jurisdictions that receives a complaint. Next slide. Some challenges for families with limited English proficiency is being able to communicate in um, ways that we navigate our life every day, right? Uh, so for instance, going to the doctors or enrolling kids in school, um, speaking with police officers at traffic stops, uh, being able to identify jobs or um, being able to navigate public transportation systems. Things that we often take for granted can be very challenging um, for LEP families and individuals. Being able to communicate your thoughts and be understood um, can be very empowering and the opposite is true, right? When you're not able to communicate your thoughts or be understood, um, it can be disenfranchising. Next slide. So best practices when working with folks with limited English proficiency. We need to avoid using family members, um, whether it's children or friends or untrained volunteers as, a, as um, interpreters, because that um, can cause challenges and it can also have um, legal and ethical um, conflicts. For instance, uh, with children, if you're using a child to interpret a conversation, um, the child may not know all of the words. I will give a, an example that I share often. Um, I'm an immigrant. Uh, we migrated to this country when I was six years old. When um, I was about seven, my mom got very sick. We had to go to the ER. Her appendix has, had burst. And the staff at the hospital, we couldn't find a bilingual staff member that could help us fill out the form to say, her appendix has, had burst. My mom kept telling my sister and I, who were in ESOL classes, tell them my appendix burst. But my sister being nine, we being seven, we didn't know the English word for appendix. We didn't really understand the Spanish word for appendix other than it's somewhere in our mom's belly. Um, and it was fortunately resolved very quickly. A bilingual staff member was able to come and assist us. But more than 30 years later, I still remember that event and it still um, causes my heart to race a little bit faster because I worry about what could have happened if nobody had been able to explain that. Um, it can also trigger children in other ways, recalling difficult situations. Um, when we're using friends, and I say that in quotation mark, um, to talk about something, we may be talking to an abuser um, in a relationship or an abusive employer or abusive landlord. So that's why we want to make sure that when we are communicating with um, families with limited English proficiency, we are using interpreters that come through um, either are employed by the school system or go through one of our language access partners. Next slide. As we discussed earlier, our different um, Languages are spoken um, throughout the county, Spanish, um, Nepali, Korean, Russian, Yoruba, or other West African languages. And these numbers are slightly different than the numbers that we talked about earlier because they're based on 2019 data. Next slide. And we'll talk about briefly about using telephonic interpretation. Uh, this is working with a professional to interpret conversations uh, via phone. And this can happen using a, a cell phone or a, a landline. Next slide. Uh, language line is an over the phone, like I said, landline or cell phone interpretation services. 
through language line, telephonic interpretation <coughs> services are available around the clock. So 365 days a week, seven days, um, 365 days a year, um, 24 hours a day. Uh, currently, what Baltimore County uses is language line services, and they provide services in more than 200 plus um, languages. Next slide. How uh, front desk staff and schools can be um, helpful to families with limited English proficiency is having um, I speak cards uh, be available or be displayed in public facing spaces. That way, a family with limited English proficiency can point to the language that they speak so that while you're in the process of calling um, language line, you have been able to identify the language that the family speaks. Uh, next slide. When you're working with an interpreter, um, it's important obviously to determine the language that um, the individual speaks. Um, to speak slower than usual, to use plain and simple language, um, speak two or three sentences at a time, and then pause. This allows the interpret interpreter to do their job. Uh, most importantly, obviously, please remember to treat the interpreter and the individual with limited English proficiency with respect and dignity. Next slide. Things that we can all do together is be aware of cultural competencies, um, be aware and be um, enforcing language access across the enterprise. Um, learn about trauma informed care, being present, recognizing trauma understanding the different barriers that families um, have, avoiding personal paternalization and infantilization. These folks um, are very capable individuals. Um, just because they are new to Baltimore County does not mean that they're not able to um, make decisions for themselves or learn and be able to function throughout life um, in good ways. Um, and it's also very important to familiarize yourselves with services available throughout the county. Next slide. Contributions uh, for our new neighbors are that they are key contributors in, set, um, in certain labor sectors or tax revenue, their intellectual contribution, their entrepreneurialism and innovation. Um, neighborhood revitalization, we see neighborhoods change as um, new Americans move in there. There's new businesses, it increases safety, it brings diversity. My personal um, favorite food, there's nothing like eating authentic Kenyan food um, when one is not from Kenya. Next slide. Any questions, um, you may uh, reach out to me either on the email or my phone. My contact information is there. And next slide. If you're curious about our report, um, that QR code will take you to the report. Okay. All righty. That was an excellent exemplary report, Ms. Banks, and we thank you so much for that. Are there any questions for Ms. Banks at this time? Okay, hearing none. The last yes, agenda item. Good. I'm sorry. This is board member Fran Pong. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Fran Pong. Um, so, Ms. Juliana Banks, I'm sorry, Ms. Valencia Banks, thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess what I would like to, to know or understand better is what are the takeaways um, that you would have for us as, as the board for Baltimore County um, and, and how these things specifically within equity or the school system. Um, so what are some things that you would, I guess, if you would want to highlight in particular for us that we should be mindful of or aware of with regards, with regard to um, governance of the, of the school? Thank you so much. Excellent question. I think understanding that the New American community is very diverse, that it's not a monolith, that our response to this community um, cannot be cookie cutter and it, it's not um, going to be a one-stop shop answer solution, right? Uh, the community is very diverse and their needs are very diverse. Everything from creating and ensuring that each school is uh, following the regulations regarding 
language access is very, very important. My office um, hears quite often uh, from families that are not being served with interpreters. Uh, we hear often of the challenges that some of the um, college counselors have in working with students that are mixed status or undocumented. So understanding that uh, being undocumented should not be a barrier to going to college or finding work, that there's innovative solutions for this. Um, recognizing that many of these families may not have access to traditional forms of support. So many of them may be uninsured and uninsurable. Many of them may be facing discrimination and hate bias um, throughout their neighborhoods, uh, that many of them may also be unaware of the services that are available through the school system or through um, Baltimore County government. So looking at our community and realizing that while there are many contributions and benefits to having them in the county, that it also requires um, an intentional approach to working with these communities, understanding that limited English proficiency doesn't have a, a reflection on somebody's IQ, that it's just their ability to communicate in English is really important. Thank you. Miss um, Scott has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to say I, I heard this report um, before, and I think that it's even uh, better this time. Um, with the information that you gave. So thank you very much for doing that. And my question was, as far as um, any sort of, um, I guess, as you can speak about it, issues or things that you feel that um, the school system can approve, improve upon as it relates to the populations that you mentioned. Um, you did give some examples, but what are some areas that can be approved? And I guess areas specifically, that the board can look at in their purview um, as members? Thank you so much for that question. Um, issues that are important to address and things that the board can have an impact in is when we're looking at budgets, um, how we are um, delegating funds to serve uh, multilingual families and communities, uh, whether it's um, improving the budgets, increasing the budgets for language access, uh, translation and interpretation services do cost money, and sometimes um, that can be a deterrent for using those services. So ensuring that every school has a substantial um, budget um, to provide translations and interpretations, ensuring that uh, there are um, adequate services, um, not adequate, better than adequate, um, services for undocumented families, whether it's the student or the parents themselves, ensuring that um, new American students are able to access mental health services. Many of them come with significant levels of mental health issues, whether it's because of trauma or things that they have witnessed. And so making sure that mental health services are available in a linguistically and culturally competent way. So these, um, these are all budget issues, right? How, how much we're able to um, pay a social worker um, that's multilingual and is culturally competent versus a social worker um, that doesn't speak um, other languages. Um, ensuring that we're developing our staff to learn how to work with, um, with new American families, that we're providing um, professional development for them, but also ensuring that there's uh, their specialized training. So for instance, with our college counselors or our workforce development folks, that they are learning about ways to serve um, folks that live in mixed status households. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Doug, did you have a question? Uh, yes, stop the boy. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Valencia Banks, this had a question about, um, I guess, in regards to language access. Um, is is so for Baltimore County, is BCPS the sole provider for school aged children in terms of language access? Um, within the school system, yes. Okay. And so, so different. 
I apologize. Continue. No, so I guess I want to make sure I just I want to make sure I'm clear with my question. So I think I understand like BCPS's role in helping our new American students become um, English proficient. Uh, didn't know there's any, you know, cost free services like you talked about. Um, you know what the law dictates about um, services being available. Um, um, when you talked about like federal laws and whatnot. So are, I guess are there any services outside of I'm thinking of the school, the school day, the school system um, that would also help to um, I guess I'm thinking about even how to accelerate perhaps the, the English proficiency of, of students, um, you know, any type of other agencies or anything that are um, in place to do that. So our community college has a great um, English as second language program. There are some Churches throughout the county that also provide um, ESOL classes. Um, all of our county departments are supposed to provide um, language access to families. And please notice that I did say are supposed to, um, because similar to BCPS, we know that that does not always happen. But there are um, great nonprofits that have uh, online programs that folks can um, log into and um, do English classes um, through Zoom, um, various faith communities, like I mentioned, the community college. Um, Lutheran Social Services connects folks to ESOL programs. Um, very um, close to the city county line, the Immigration Outreach Service Center also provides English classes. OK, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? I had another question. This is Miss Scott. Okay, Miss Scott. Thank you. Um, I didn't know, and forgive me if I missed it in the report. Um, did you have the numbers by which our um, county is projected to grow by with um, the population that you were referencing? We don't have it in the report, but um, our best estimates just looking at trends is that the community will increase by 5%. Okay, and what sort of impact do you see that having on the school system? We'll see obviously um, an increase in students and an increase in need for services, whether it's ESOL, whether it's mental health, whether it's um, primary and preventive care for students. Um, uninsured and uninsurable students, uh, for instance, often can't participate in after school um, sports because they're not able to get a sports physical because they don't have health insurance. Oh, wow, thank you. I'd like to ask a question. This is Dr. Savoy. Are we still having evening classes for those students who have to work during the day to support their families? Anyone? I think that's more of a BCPS question. Oh, okay, I thought you knew. Okay, um, anyone else have a question? Okay, thank you for that excellent presentation, Ms. Banks. If there are no more questions, we'll move on. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The Equity Committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 18, 2024 at 4 o'clock p.m. The next Equity Committee meeting with the Equity Council is scheduled for Thursday, March 21st, 2024 at 5.30. All right, is there any further business? Hearing none. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.